Amen. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, turn your Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 1. All right, come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, Terry. Oh, Picking up our, our theme scripture here in Ephesians 1, verse 4. Okay. And in the Bible, it reads, it says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be homely and blameless in his sight. And I love this passage of scripture. What is chosen? What chosen means to be selected or marked for favor or special privilege. And so the Bible said, hey, for he's chosen you. He's selected you personally since the beginning of creation. That's really cool. We know God created the earth since the beginning of day. God's chosen you. Amen. Wow. Right? And that's totally God's grace if you think of nothing else right there, right? Do we deserve it? No, not one bit. We'll get into that as well as I share my life. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, today we're going to look at a story who, of a guy who was chosen. Mm. You know, we're going to look at a, a guy who was set apart since birth. Mm. We're going to look at the story of Moses. Come on, Moses! However, many of us are very um, familiar with this popular Bible character, right? right. I mean, there's a ton of movies about this man. Right. I mean, uh, there's this... 1956 classic, The Ten Commandments, yeah. uh, a, 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 a film that's been shown on almost just about every single television network every Easter since 1973. Wow. wow. This is a very popular guy here, right? Yeah. Uh, we know uh, stories of Moses that he led uh, over a million people uh, out of Egypt and freed them. Other movies depicts the Exodus story as well as the, I don't know if some of you guys may be familiar with it, but... The Prince of Egypt. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the, one right the 1998 there. classic right there. Oh, and so for us, many of us in this room, we already know whether we grew up in the church or, 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 or ourselves or maybe we didn't go to church. A lot of us are familiar with the character of Moses. Yeah. And a lot of us are familiar with the story of what he done. Yeah. However, we're not going to talk about that story. Nah. <laughs> we're not going to talk about that story. Okay. However, we're going to talk about another story of Moses that's in the Bible. We're going to look at Moses' life before he's called. Come on. We're going to look at Moses' life where he was at since the beginning of his birth and how God was preparing Moses since the beginning. Because indeed, God has chosen Moses. Come on. Which brings me to the title of my lesson today is Chosen. Come on. Let's go over to Exodus chapter 2. Okay. Exodus chapter 2. And as you turn in there, there's so many scriptures you can learn from. I, I, I'm just blown away by the Bible. You know, Romans 15, 4, you don't have to turn it there, but it, te- it teaches us that whatever was written in the past was written to teach us right. so that we may have hope. Amen. And so all throughout the Bible, whether it's Old Testament, New Testament, it's literally something we can draw meaning from. Right. Amen? So let's draw some meaning from uh, Exodus chapter 2, and we look at Moses' life. Yeah. I only got two points for you guys. I know some of you guys are probably thinking about... Um, Fellowship and spending time with family and uh, maybe getting some uh, physical food, right? <laughs> but I want to encourage you all with some spiritual food this morning. Amen. Amen. Come on, bro. My first point is reliance on God's providence. Reliance on God's providence. Exodus chapter 2, we pick it up here in verse 1. It says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. That's awesome. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put him on the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. And her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened up it and saw the baby. He was crying. I can only imagine as a father. (laughs) And she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for her. I will pay you. It's a good, it's a good return right there. Right. <laughs> so the woman took the baby and nursed him. Verse 10. When a child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, 
and it became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. I mean, wow. Here we see the birth of Moses, but also we see God's providence yeah. working in the midst of all of this. You know, Hebrews 11, 23, you don't have to turn it there, but it says that Moses' parents, by faith, hid him because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's orders. You know, during this time period, just roughly a chapter before this, uh, there was a king, and his name was Pharaoh. And this wasn't the nice Pharaoh during Joseph's time. No, this was a different Pharaoh who became very ticked off yeah. with God's people. Yeah. So much to the point, he, he hated them and despised them so much that he wanted to pretty much just wipe them out. Yeah. More so, and particularly, the men. Yeah. And so, you got to think about the setting there. But also, you're going to start to see God's providence in the midst of it all. Come on. You know, what's providence? Providence is the protective care and guidance of God. It means foresight. It's the act of providing or preparing for future use or application. Come on. And so how God was preparing his plan for the life of Moses way before Moses was even born. Yeah. You know, in context, we, we understand the scenario now. This was what Moses was born into. I cannot help but think about uh, a, a, a distressful situation, kind of like the pandemic we're in, of all the kids born during this time such as now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of interesting because Moses' parents, what did they do? They decide to take the baby and hide him, and then they put him into this basket. It's kind of odd. Mm-hmm. Put your kid in the basket, like, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> right? No. But the cool thing about this is the basket was made out of a, a particular certain type of material. The papyrus, right? And then they coat this papyrus, like this weaved up, like reed, if you will, and they coat it with tar and pitch, pretty much to waterproof it. Mm-hmm. It's along the river. So it's really cool how Moses' parents are like, you know what? I'm going to go by faith. I'm going to trust God's providence here. Man. That God's going to protect my only son. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to sit it right over here, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that's the scenario there. Yeah. But that's not it. Moses is placed alone by the reeds along the bank around the Nile. But me, I, can, I cannot help but think like, well, what's usually along the Nile River? I cannot but help think about all the probably dangerous animals this thing, right? You gotta think about that. Sometimes we just think like, well, Moses was paid for the basket. <laughs> hey man, then he leads people. Awesome, that's a cool story. But we forget the setting that was taking place there. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty sure there's a ton of mosquitoes. Oh. <laughs> And last time I checked, I'm pretty sure malaria it still has a deadly effect in today's time, and I'm pretty sure it was the same then. Yeah. I think about the crocodiles. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on average, the adult male now crocodile, uh, his length was between 11 and 16 feet. Mm. And it weighed about 500 to 1,600 pounds. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. It's crazy. I think about the hippos. Oh, 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 oh. We forget about them sometimes. Sometimes we think they're like friendly little creatures that want to no. be pet. No. 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 Not whatsoever. They're super, actually, very aggressive and very territorial. And we all know the size of the hippos. But I cannot help think about all this situation going on in the animals, but then this little child right by the reed. Again, God's providence. Yeah. And despite all of this going on externally, God said was involved. He had a plan. You know, I don't even think it's a coincidence that Moses' mother, trusting God, let her baby go, and then it comes back full circle. Mm -hmm. That the the Egyptian king, who wanted to kill all the boys, out of all the people, it's his daughter. Wow. (laughs) It's his daughter that noticed Moses. (laughs) And a sense of compassion I'm pretty sure she has, like, wow, I hear crying. Wait, what, what, why is this baby here? And then all of a sudden it comes back full circle where the baby ends back up into his own biological yeah. mother's hands. Yeah. Yeah. And get paid for it, amen? Right. <laughs> but you also got to think about the scene. If it was according to the Bible, and it's fact, right? According to the Bible, if the scene in the setting was that every son was being killed. Yeah. Think about the horrific scene that would have been there. Yeah. We forget about that. Yeah. 
every the, the 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 order was that every son gets killed, and so I'm pretty sure as the mom is bringing her own son to the Nile River, think about the horrific scene that's right in front of you. That takes a lot of faith. Yeah. yeah. I can only but help but think about all the babies possibly drowned. I'm pretty sure they did. Oh I cannot help but think about all the crying and the, and, the, and, the, and the pain. And then just think about maybe all the, maybe the other parents see that too. And maybe the other soldiers are pulling those parents away just so the, the, the boys could, could be drowned. Wow. We forget about that. But again, God had a plan. Yeah. Yeah. God's providers. You know, Acts 7, 20 to 22, you don't have to turn it there. There's a, there's a guy named Stephen. He was a preacher. He was a disciple. And he was preaching about the Jews. And he says, at the time Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child, for three months he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as his own son. Moses was educated in all wisdom of the Egyptians. It was powerful in speech and action. Sometimes we think about, man, yeah, Moses... He led people. But we can't forget the fact that this guy was thoroughly educated. Mm -hmm. I mean, Egyptians, like, culturally, hysterically, they're kind of known to create a lot of stuff, like arithmetic stuff I don't like. <laughs> Geometry, all this stuff came from there, right, culturally. Amen. And so you can only imagine, it probably makes sense why the, the family even had an idea of creating this papyrus basket in Coton. Like, I would have never thought of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But we know Moses was thoroughly educated. Yeah. Again, God had a plan. God was preparing his plan for Moses' life. Amen. Equipping him with the necessary tools since the beginning. Uh -huh. God's providence in the life of Moses. You know, looking at this passage of scripture, I cannot help but think about all the gamut and all the stuff that had to happen in my life. In order for me to even be where I am today. Amen. You know, oftentimes I think sometimes we talk about remembering and remember what Christ done in our lives, but oftentimes when I remember all the stuff externally that had to happen in order for that to happen even in your own personal lives seated here in this morning, right? Right. The stuff like your family had to go through for you to be in the seat. Right. The stuff that people who paved the way before us had to go through in order for us to be in these seats. Right. We forget about those things. Yeah. And I th cannot but help me think about my own life and adversity and how God's continued to help me overcome in a lot of those ways. You know, just a little bit about myself. I'm originally from San Francisco, Bay Area, amen? Oh. And, um, you know, coming from a family of five, uh, you know, my intermediate family, it was my mom, my dad, my brother, and my sister, and I was the youngest of the three. And uh, we grew up in public housing. It was a, just pretty much, a, you know, just a, a low-income um, community, if you will. And I was thinking about it, just kind of patterned. I was like, wow, five family members, but one source of income. God's totally provided. Yeah. Yeah. Overcoming adversity and education, I mean, yeah. uh, for sadly, we live in a world where there's so much inequality, even when it comes to our education systems. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm grateful because before I was even born, my mom, who worked in education somewhat for some time, she started to kind of be, become more aware of what was going on. And so now when she had children, she was able to advocate for us. And I'm really grateful for this time because, you know, in uh, elementary school, it was a time period in my life when the teachers want to place me in special education. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like buying in and bleeding into this like prison, uh, school to prison pipeline, if you will, this inequality system that's set up for students and, and people of, uh, uh, and, and like less fortunate communities. And they put them in this system based on their zip codes rather than their performance. Yeah. But I'm so grateful, Pat, now that my mom thoroughly externally was working behind the scenes for my behalf. Yeah. Again, God was working through that. I think about overcoming the adversity just, again, what I was sharing, growing up where I grew up, isolated in a poor community in San Francisco, because oftentimes you only think about the Golden Gate Bridge, it's all around <laughs> movies, you think about the Big Pyramid, right? You think about Alcatraz, you don't want to go there, right? That's the prison. <laughs> but um, even though I grew up in this isolated, uh, poor community, right, the way we look at it in, the, in American fashion, but yet, I, I, I cannot help but think, but we always have food on the table. Yeah. We had a close dynamic, like a close family, a close-knit family. Yeah. Right. Nobody didn't seem like we had much. It seemed like we had the whole world. Right. Again, God's providence. Yeah. Overcoming adversity is internally, like fears, just living in that yeah. community with so much gang violence. Uh -huh. yeah. So many of my friends either 
went to prison behind whatever choices they made, but sadly for some, very young, at teenage years, middle school, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, like being gunned down. Wow. Even if you didn't want anything to do with anything, it's just, it was just an unsafe environment. Oh, yeah. And so for me having this internal fear that, man, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make it to the age of 18. But I'm here now, obviously, thank God. Yes, God. <laughs> God's provided. You know, overcoming adversity through sports. I mean, yeah, I know it's shared. I had the opportunity to play collegiate ball and stuff, but most people don't know this story. <laughs> you know, overcoming through sports, I, I went to a high school, was it like uh, like top tier, very competitive by nature or whatnot? Uh, so with that said, we never won more than four games. Throughout my whole entire high school career. What's up, Bert? Like, think about that. My sophomore year, we went nothing. Junior year, we won two games. We got really excited. We thought we could go, you know, have fun. And then we lost the rest of the games throughout the rest of the season. And then my senior year, we won two more games. So that, that made that kind of for it, man. Overcoming adversity. Right, right. Um, overcoming adversity to get into college. UC Berkeley. I actually got denied the first time. <laughs> but I'm so grateful that I got accepted the second time on an appeal process. Overcoming adversity in college, it was a culture shock at first, but overcoming adversity there to earn a full scholarship athletically. Wow. I started off as a walk on student athlete, didn't get paid nothing. <laughs> like, they were looking for the other athletes, but they wasn't looking for me. <laughs> they wasn't checking for me. I wasn't recruited by them, right? But just being having the opportunity to be on the team and work my way up. And overcome adversity. Yeah. Right you know, overcome yeah. adversity while in college and being able to graduate on time mm -hmm. with over a 3.0 GPA. Wow. And being the first in my family to actually attain a bachelor's degree. Oh, wow. Overcoming adversity. Overcoming adversity and being a responsible adult. <laughs> you know, post grad now, learning how to pay my bills on time, <laughs> buying that, uh, look for a job, following after graduation, right? I can learn those things. Overcoming adversity. Yeah. God was preparing me. Why was this all happening? God was preparing me. He was molding me. He was shaping me. Right. Preparing me for a plan that I didn't even know that was going to come later down the line. Because mm -hmm. honestly, moments after this, I was met by some disciples. I began studying the Bible, and on May 13, 2015, I was baptized. Oh. <laughs> but the crazy thing, it didn't stop there. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> I had to overcome some more adversity and some more opposition. Uh, Learn how to learn how to apply the Bible to my life to put God first yeah. above my family, yeah. above my careers, yeah. above my friends. And not even after that, shortly after, not even notice like those people who studied the Bible with me and mentored me would as soon make the decision to walk away from God. Yeah. 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 And then stop there. And then the people I got a chance to, to help and impact and study the Bible with and baptize and mentor, see them walk away from God. Yeah. What was God teaching me through all of this? How to persevere. Yeah. You know, and I think about it in the same aspect, even with Moses' life here. God was shaping his life since the beginning. Yeah. God's chosen him. And how does all of this damn things relate to us today? Well, for many of us, we actually don't really know. Like I said, we don't know what all has to happen or what have happened. For us to even be here to fill these rooms, fill this room up right now this morning. You can even never even to even think yeah. about how God had to move the pieces in your life. Yeah. But the encouraging thing, just like the Joneses said, you're here this morning. Why? Because God chose you guys. Amen. 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 I'm just trying to lift you up right there. You can come on. Come on. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, yeah. God chose you. That's something you're grateful for. Amen. Right? Yes. But here's the thing, you know, as the scripture in Acts 17, it talks about how God determined the time and places yeah. in your life. Yeah. Not just because he chose you. But hopefully in return, you choose him in return. Come on, come on, yeah. bro. There we go. Yes. You know, we're here today because God has incredible plans for us. But yes, are you going to choose God in return? Amen. You know, God doesn't forsake us. We forsake him. Yeah. Yeah. So how can we forsake God? God, God? We can forsake God just by deciding to stop trusting in God. Yeah. And trusting in God, not just partially, but fully trusting God with our lives, even through the midst of a pandemic. We can forsake God by being impure. We can forsake God by having an emotional roller coaster just going up and down in our lives, but never having a great foundation that keeps us solid and committed. Yeah. We can forsake God by not trusting in Him with our future. True. 
We could forsake God by not choosing him every morning, every single day, just to talk to him. And it's crazy that we live in a world, sadly, that want all of God. And we want what all God can do for us, 100% of God. But we can't even give God 10%, let alone our whole heart. But that's the situation we live in. But the cool thing about it, we have a decision to make. We don't have to stay that way. We could be those who are just like Moses and actually do something about it. You know, for us, we have to decide whether we are going to rely on God's providence are we going to rely on ourselves? On. You know, I want to challenge this here. Because I don't really believe that you're going to be impacted just by my example. No, i got to call you to make a decision. Mm-hmm. And I want to call you to a decision to fully rely on God. Mm-hmm. On. Through the scriptures. Yeah. That's what changed Moses. That's what changed me. And I totally believe that's what could change each and every one of us here this morning if we make a decision to do likewise. Are you with me? Amen. 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 You know, if you are guests here, thank you for coming out to our Bring Your Neighbors Day service. You know, and I want to challenge you guys if, to study the Bible. Yeah. Get with the person that invited you out. Study the Bible. The scriptures are amazing. It's inspiring. Yeah. It's been around for ages. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, something got to be right. <laughs> <laughs> study the Bible and actually apply the Bible in areas of your life where you're weak too. Yeah. So you can see God Work in your life, and you can be the man and woman that God so desires as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Point number two, perceiving the vision of God. Let's go back to our text in Exodus 2. Perceiving the vision of God. Exodus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. It says, one day, one day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking his way, and that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Come on, man, why are you hitting him? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? (laughs) Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Oh no. Verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this, He tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered the flock. When the girls returned to rule, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he, Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom. Said, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. In their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac, with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. We'll pause right here. We see a lot of people for this past scripture looking. Just like how you guys looking at me. I'm looking at you, right? We see a lot of people looking. (laughs) Moses was looking and seeing that the situation was going on in the life at the time. And just see the, the injustice, the oppression of the Egyptians, pretty much humiliating his people, bashing his people, oppressing his people, keeping them down in slavery. And then we see God look and he sees it all. And he's concerned. And he wants us to do something about it. You know, Moses begins to perceive and realize really what's going on around him. What perceived me is just to become aware. We already know, we already established that he was educated, right? And so now Moses begins to see the world how God sees it. Harassed and helpless. And the thing about Moses, he wanted to do good. He's like, I, I got to do something about this. I, I want to help. Hey, stop hitting your brother. Stop doing those things. Stop it. Now he makes some bonehead mistakes along the line. Kills the one that's not cool, right? No. Right? It's no, not cool. Not <laughs> <laughs> and so for this, he, he flees. He runs off and goes to another land, medium. But I love here in verse 1. I mean, I'm sorry, verse 11. It says, one day after Moses had grown up, and in context, just to kind of pan out a little bit, in, in Acts 7, it says when Moses was 40 years old, 
he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. And so at this time period, even though here verse 11 says after, I mean, one day after Moses had full, uh, been fully grown, some time has went by since he was a kid. Wow. Moses is 40 years old right now. Yeah. Wow. So think about his life. Like, man, teenage years, seeing this, nothing's changing. 13, 14, 15, 16, nothing's still changing. It's still oppression. His people are still enslaved. All these different things in, in, in his heart, based on the scriptures, he wanted to do something about it. He had, a, he had a goodness in his heart. He wanted to change the circumstance. And I'm pretty sure he was so frustrated, like, hey, I'm trying to do my best. I'm educated. I'm trying to help people. But it seems like it's not working. Mm -hmm. Commentary. For 40 years. And so we learned that Moses is 40. And by this time, we learned and he sees the desires that Moses just wanted justice. Yeah. Like many of us, we want justice. Right. We want freedom. We want all these different aspects. We want equality. We want fairness for all people, do we not? Amen. But here, we see the same situation. That was Moses' heart. Yeah. But he still didn't have the answers, at least not just yet. But I love this passage of scripture. We can see it. Let's just kind of look into Moses' heart. Look at verse 17. Come on, Terry. We see that he sees people mistreated. We deal with the situation with the, the Hebrews. But also... We see him deal with a situation with women. And I love this because this is God's heart for women as well. Amen. And we can learn something from this passage of scripture. It's awesome that Women's Day is coming up. Yeah. And he later sees seven women being mistreated by the water well by shepherds. And he comes to their aid. Now, I started to kind of think, well, why does Moses take a stand for the women against shepherds? I mean, in the Bible, wasn't Moses himself a shepherd? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like, why is he going against his people? You're like, I'm kind of confused here, right? And that's what I love about the Bible. You know, uh, scholars believe that there were desert rules. And what it meant, just in summary, is just the people at the well, they'll go draw water from the well, right? And the rule was, it was pretty much first come, first serve. And so think about it. You got these women who are here waiting in line, waiting in line for the next turn, <laughs> waiting in line. But then you have these guys just kind of interject and cut them. And Moses sees that. And Moses like, hey, that's not cool, dude. And he defends them. Yeah. Yeah. His heart, he was just like, hey, justice needs, justice needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And we know this to be the case because honestly, the Bible kind of tells you, it says that when they get home, their father's kind of blown away. Hey, why'd you go back so early? Indicate what? Maybe it took us some time to get back home. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the journey. Or maybe they're still waiting by the well. And I love this because you see God's heart here, even not just for men, but also for women. Yeah. And that also has to be ourself in our heart, even today in our 21st century day and age. Like, all you got to do is cut on the news and cut on the media, entertainment, and just see how women in our modern day is portrayed. Yeah. It's sad. Yeah. It's sad. And according to my Bible, God looks down and he's concerned yeah. very much. Full of compassion, wants to change the portrayal of how women are viewed. Mm -hmm. And not just that, even how men is viewed. Sadly, we live in a day and time like, hey, the, the, the world defines what it means to be a man. The world defines what it means to be a woman. But according to my Bible, the best way to be a man or a woman is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the ultimate definition of what it means to walk with God. He's the ultimate definition of what it means to be human. Thank God God chose us. Yeah. You know, for me, I can relate. You know, see the conditions of the world for myself. Um, and though, like I shared earlier in my story, growing up in that type of environment, I, I had an alarm in my heart and a desire to, like, want to do good. I think that's why I did want to go to college. Because at first it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't on the table. I was like, oh, I guess I'm just going to be like everybody else around here, right? <laughs> but then it started to click. I was like, you know what? Been, since I was the youngest, I was very observant of how kind of people move if that makes sense and so for me I was like well mm, this person chose that route and he did this it seemed like it didn't work ah nah that ain't work <laughs> this person did this they got in trouble for it I'm not gonna do that that ain't work and so for me I was kind of taught like you know uh, not just power right this is old saying in America and I don't really know what that looked like to be honest right um I just do I was like okay I, I gotta go to school I gotta go to college didn't know what that would look like and how to apply right 
But obviously through just educating and educating myself and just seeking education and seeking wisdom from other people, family members, mentors, just trying to consume as much wisdom I can so I can become more aware and more conscious yeah. of the world around me. But it bothered me because I just had like an indignation in me. I was like, man, I, I want to change the narrative. I want to change what it, what it means to, 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 to be a man of color, honestly, in America. I, I want to change that narrative. I'm tired of seeing people that look like me and their lifestyles like that. And I'm tired of seeing friends who don't look like me. Sometimes their lifestyle looks like that too because it's just sin at the end of the day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so for me, I was like, you know what? I made a decision. I was like, you know what? I, gotta, I, gotta, I want to be an example. Yeah. I, I, want, I, want, I remember, I remember just saying that, like as a, as a teen, like man, I want to be an example. I want to change the narrative for my family, my yeah. community, and make a difference in the world. Amen. 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 But honestly, as, as fast forward, it was frustrating because I, I I did all I could, at least what I thought. I, I tried to do as good as much good as possible. I would go to different schools around the Bay Area and speak to the youth and do all these different things and amazing things. Uh, in my fraternity in college, we would. Plan these different events, uh, not just a one-time event, because sometimes people feel like, just come here, and then you leave, and just, you're right, right. <laughs> just, just step in and help us, and now you can go about your life, and we're still stuck here in this situation. It's like, you know, we, we created a cool program that was like, actually going to help get people on track to where they needed to be, yeah. Amen. right? It was like a, a great initiative, if you will. And we were, really, where we did, we, we, we took, you know, young men of color, and connecting them to the tech industry. Obviously, the Bay Area is big for that, right? Yeah. And we just try to create this little pipeline. And so it was really cool because we started to get Google involved. Oh, Google, yeah. Google, was, Google was seeing everybody in that room, other nonprofits that help cater to like uh, this particular um, demographic. And they were so blown away by all the people in their heart and their desire to do good, they started to fund them for it. Yeah. And so in my mind, I'm like, man, we're, we're doing good here, you know? <laughs> connecting kids to, to an opportunity and then at my job and nonprofit in that field, we were we were providing job opportunities for people who had barriers to work, whether you were incarcerated, whether you had mental mental health, whether you was just homeless, whatever it was, like we we're doing good by the world standard. Yeah. Wow. By the world standard. Yeah. And it bothered me because I'm like, I would go to work every single day, pour out my guts and do the best I can. But it bothered me, I was like, it seems like it's, it's something still missing. Yeah. It's not solving the issue. Because like Moses, I have to clearly see that it was never a physical issue. Right. It was always wow. a spiritual issue. Wow. Wow. And even though for me, I was like, wow, I'm trying to do good. <laughs> but it's not the solution. Mm -hmm. What's the right. solution? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Come on, bro. So what is the solution? 2 okay. well, Corinthians chapter 5. Come as we get ready to come around the band and close out. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yeah, bro. I love this passage of scripture. It says in verse 14, it says, For Christ's love compels us, because we're convinced that no one, that, uh, that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Amen. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And then you read further on, it talks about, in a time of my favor, I heard you. During your, your crying and your suffering, God heard you, your cries. This is the reason why you're still here to this day. God heard your cries. Yeah. And it did something about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it caused to do something about it today. And he says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Yeah. Now is the day of salvation. <laughs> and it's just so incredible because for me, I was like, wow, it, it makes more sense now. Though I try to do good by the world standard, it didn't solve the issues at all. <laughs> but yet I have the Bible that it fully equips me and helps me understand yeah. the true ultimate solution. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a spiritual one. It's, it's literally yeah. taking God's word and teaching other people about Jesus. Yeah. It's literally taking God's word, not just to inform, but to really convert their heart. Yeah. So that they can make a decision for themselves and not be caught up with the lives of the world, but actually take a stand for God. Amen. Why? Because they love God. Yeah. And that was the reconciliation part where God was now bringing his lost people back to him. Come on, God. Restoring them back to him, 
back to their first love like it's supposed to be in, since the day of the, the Garden of Eve. Since then, God was pulling people back to him. And now they have to come for me making a decision. Like, man, I got to open my mouth. I have to share the gospel. And so for me, this is really the reason why I got into ministry. Because I seen the world for what it was. Like, you know what? This job is awesome. It's paying my bills. I was grateful for that. Amen. I was grateful for that. Amen. But at the end of the day, I was like, man, there's so much more I could be doing. And whether that was going to be an event or not, it was so much more I can do. It's so much opportunity to serve in God's kingdom. Yeah. I mean, chemical recovery, that wasn't fully my background, but I, I stepped up to the plate and filled it in the gap to lead it. Come on, bro. Yeah. But for some of us in this room, like, you want to serve, like, get into the aspect of just applying yourself Come on. fully to the service Come on, of God so you can be used by God. Yeah. And with Moses, the difference between him, it talks about it in Hebrews. He no longer wants to, 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 to partake in the, the fleeting pleasures of sin. Mm-hmm. He wants to be treated just like his people. Mm-hmm. For us, for some of us in this room, we call ourselves Christians. Mm-hmm. And for us, we got to unplug ourselves from what the world standard is yeah. and baptize our desires. Don't we want to do good, but baptize that into the kingdom. Come on, yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah, that's great. So I have a challenge for you guys. Really simple. For us who are disciples, going to pay it forward by seeking and saving the lost, mm-hmm. but also getting a vision for the kingdom. Yeah. Because if you don't make the decision, what about your neighbor? Mm-hmm. If you don't make the decision, what about your family? Wow. Just imagine this. I think we all can agree on this. If everybody was a disciple, everybody followed Jesus, wouldn't our world be a, a little bit oh. a better place? Yeah. Yeah. Here's the thing. Whether you believe in God or not, we all can agree upon that, right? Yeah. But all it takes is a decision. To make it actually happen. Again, if you're a guest, I want to challenge you too. Maybe you're unsure of how to do that yourself. That's fine. What I love about the Bible is there to teach us, yeah. to correct us, to yeah. rebuke us, and to train us. Mm-hmm. So guess what? You too can learn of how, to, how to actually apply the Bible and go help and join and help more people have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, as we conclude, you know, I'm super grateful for y'all, you guys allowing me to share. Come on, babe. But I also want you to understand, don't allow this to just... Follow your ears and just leave out of here, not make a decision. Wow. Right? Make a decision. Understand who God has designed each and every one of you to be. Yeah. You're chosen. Mm-hmm. You're chosen. And those who actually embrace that and understand that, it, it creates a catharsis in their heart to really want to do something about it. Amen. And I'm grateful because today someone has actually did just oh. that. Amen. Our brother Jose Hernandez. Yeah. Yeah. Jose Hernandez is someone who you know, about worldly standards, is very successful, a, a student, you know, at, at the Dominguez Hills, uh, studying yes. film and whatever. But it's awesome that he understands his ultimate purpose. It's not just him being a student there at Dominguez Hills. No, right. he's understanding his true identity that God chose him yeah. to be a son of yeah. God. And with that, family, thank you guys for allowing me to share. I love you guys. And to God, you all the glory. Yeah. Yeah.